the most holy God, the great I am that I am. Who can be compared to our God, the creator of heaven and earth? We come before him today to give him thanks in all things, in spite of our situations that may seem to be challenging. But God always has the final word. And we thank that everything that we go through be used for his glory and it is played upon this earth. This week, we're going to be teaching about the book of Job. Many of you may know a story about Job in the Bible, a man of prestige and a godly man. And I pray as we go into the teaching that the Spirit of God will awaken you, quicken your spirit, and to be receptive with God's word. The same saying right now and will forever say to enrich our lives, we be drawn closer to him. I truly believe that he is the only holy God. I'm the only Holy One in whom we trust and always believe the word. Be blessed and receptive as we proceed in the teachings of the book of Job. The book of Job, an overview. The book of Job addresses the age-old question of why there is suffering in the world. The author of the book is unidentified, as is the date of writing. The book gives no chronological reference points. However, there are literary clues to a setting in the time of the patriarchs, around the time of Abraham. There are no references to Israel or Mosaic law. It betrays Job as the priest for his family. His wealth is measured in livestock, not silver and gold. And Job's lifespan rivals Abraham's, and the patriarchal name for God, Shaddai, is used often. There are three theories to the date of writing. During the time of the patriarchs, about 2000 BC. During the time of Solomon, about 950 BC. Or during the exile, which is about 550 BC. Job is classified as part of the wisdom and poetic books of the Bible, since apart from the prologue, chapters 1-2 to and chapters 32-1-6, to and the epilogue in chapter 42, the book is written as poetry. The book is written in an extremely sophisticated, learned Hebrew, with a higher proportion of words unique to itself than any other book of the Hebrew Bible. Job is identified as living in the land of Uz. Lamentations places Uz in the land of Edom or northern Arabia. Satan's role of adversary of the righteous is demonstrated in Job more than in any other Old Testament book, with 14 of the 19 Old Testament references to Satan being in the book of Job. Job's three friends represent different positions. Eliphaz, a theologian who appeals to observation and experience. Bildad, a historian who appeals to tradition and history. And Zophar is a moralist. The structure of the book of Job. The book falls into five main sections. Firstly, the prologue. Chapters 1 to 2, describing Job's calamity and its cause. Section 2. Three cycles of dialogue between Job and his three friends, which is between chapters 3 and 31. The third section is four monologues by Elihu, chapters 32 to 37. The fourth section is God speaking to Job's ignorance and complaint between chapters 38 and chapter 42, verse 6. And then finally, the epilogue between chapters 42, 7 to verse 17. In chapter 1, we meet Job. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. 
One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well. Then everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Then very quickly, messengers bring Job reports of disasters. His oxen and donkeys are stolen and his servants killed. Then another messenger comes to report that his sheep and servants were killed. Then a third comes to report that the camels were stolen and his servants killed. Finally, a messenger comes to report that all his sons and daughters have been killed when their house collapses under high wind. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Satan once again presents himself before God, and the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There was no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life, but now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well. Then he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. But he replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Naamanite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. After these seven days, chapter 3 opens with Job cursing the day of his birth, but not God. The second half of the chapter is lament about seeking relief from suffering, ending with, What I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. Chapters 4 and 5 outline Eliphaz's reply. He starts by saying that Job has counseled many people in the past. Now it is his turn to receive counselling. Then he resorts to his experience. Consider now, who being innocent has ever perished? Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plough evil and those who sow trouble reap it. At the breath of God they perish, at the blast of his anger they are no more. Eliphaz then goes on to say that a spirit brought this to him at night, so it must be right. Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can even a strong man be more pure than his maker? If God places no trust in his servants, if he charges his angels with error, how much more those who live in houses of clay, whose foundations are in the dust, who are crushed more readily than a moth? In chapter 5 he says, But if I were you, I would appeal to God, I would lay my cause before him. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed. Miracles that cannot be counted. He saves the needy from the sword in their mouth. He saves them from the clutches of the powerful. 
so the poor have hope and injustice shuts his mouth. Blessed is the one whom God corrects, so do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. Eliphaz finishes, We have examined this and it's true, so hear it and apply it to yourself. In chapter 6, Job refutes Eliphaz, lamenting that God seems like his enemy. The arrows of the Almighty are in me, my spirit drinks in their poison. God's terrors are marshaled against me. Job again requests to die. Oh, that I might have my requests, that God would grant what I hope for. That God would be willing to crush me, to let loose his hand and cut off my life. Then I would still have this consolation, my joyous, unrelenting pain, that I had not denied the words of the Holy One. Job's faith and trust in God is not broken by his circumstances. Job then decries the words of his friends. Teach me, and I will be quiet. Show me where I have been wrong. How painful are honest words. But what do your arguments prove? Do you mean to correct what I said and treat my desperate words as win? You will even cast lots for the fatherless and a barter away your friend. But now be so kind as to look at me. Would I lie to your face? Relent. Do not be unjust. Reconsider, for my integrity is at stake. Is there any wickedness on my lips? Can my mouth not discern malice? In chapter 7, Job pours out his heart to God. When I lie down, I think, how long before I get up? The night drags on, and I toss and turn until dawn. Remember, O oh God, that my life is but a breath. My eyes will never see happiness again. I despise my life. I will not live forever. Let me alone. My days have no meaning. What is mankind that you make so much of them? that you may give them so much attention, that you examine them every morning and test them every moment. Will you never look away from me or let me alone even for an instant? If I have sinned, what have I done to you? You who see everything we do. Why have you made me your target? Have I become a burden to you? Why do you not pardon my offenses and forgive my sins? For I will soon lie down in the dust. You will search for me, but I will be no more. Bildad responds to Job in chapter 8. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? Can papyrus grow tall while there's no marsh? Can reeds thrive without water? While still growing and uncut, they wither more quickly than grass. Such is the destiny of all who forget God. So perishes the hope of the godless. Surely God does not reject one who is blameless or strengthens the hand of evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Your enemies will be clothed in shame and the tents of the wicked will be no more. Then Job replied, Indeed, I know that this is true. But how can mere mortals prove their innocence before God? He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed. Miracles that cannot be counted. How then can I dispute with him? How can I find words to argue with him? Though I were innocent, I could not answer him. I could only plead with my judge for mercy. Even if I were innocent, my mouth would condemn me. If I were blameless, it would pronounce me guilty. Although I am blameless, I have no concern for myself. I despise my own life. It is all the same. That is why I say he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. He is not a mere mortal like me that I might answer him. That we might confront each other in court. If only there was someone to meditate between us. Someone to bring us together. Someone to remove God's rod from me. So that his terror would frighten me no more. Then I will speak up without fail of him. But as it now stands with me, I cannot. Job then prays to God in chapter 10 for God's unfair treatment of him. 
I say to God, do not declare me guilty, but tell me what charges you have against me. Does it please you to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands while you smile on the plans of the wicked? Your hands shaped me and made me. Will you not turn and destroy me? Remember that you molded me like clay. Will you now turn me to dust again? You gave me life and showed me kindness, and in your providence watched over my spirit. But this is what you concealed in your heart, and I know that this was in your mind. If I sinned, you would be watching me and would not let my offenses go unpunished. If I am guilty, woe to me. Even if I am innocent, I cannot lift my head, for I am full of shame and drowned in my affliction. Why then did you bring me out of the womb? I wish I had died before any eye saw me. If only I had never come into being or had been carried straight from the womb to the grave. Zophar is the youngest of the three friends and he speaks last. He accuses Job of being an idle speaker. Are all these words to go unanswered? Is this talker to be vindicated? Will your idle talk reduce others to silence? Will no one rebuke you when you mock? You say to God, my beliefs are flawless and I'm pure in your sight. Oh, how I wish that God would speak, that he would open his lips against you and disclose to you the secrets of wisdom. For true wisdom has two sides. Know this, God has even forgotten some of your sin. Yet if you devote your heart to him and stretch out your hands to him, if you put away the sin that's in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, then free of fault you will lift up your face, you will stand firm and without fear. You will surely forget your trouble, recalling it only as water's gone by. In chapter 12, Job sarcastically says that his friends have all the wisdom, but he called on God and God answered. He goes on to say, To God belong wisdom and power. Counsel and understanding are his. He reveals the deep things of darkness and brings utter darkness into the light. He makes nations great and destroys them. He enlarges nation and disperses them. Job declares in chapter 13, But I desire to speak to the Almighty and to argue my case with God. He criticizes his friends. You, however, smear me with lies. You are worthless physicians, all of you. If only you would be altogether silent. For you, that would be wisdom. Will you speak wickedly on God's behalf? Will you speak deceitfully for him? Keep silent and let me speak. Then let come to me what may. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. Indeed, this will turn out for my deliverance, for no godless person will dare come before him. In chapter 14, Job shows insight into the resurrection. As the water of a lake dries up, or a riverbed becomes parched and dry, so he lies down and does not rise. Till the heavens are no more, people will not awake or be roused from their sleep. If only you would hide me in the grave and conceal me till your anger has passed. If only you would set me a time and then remember me. If someone dies, will they live again all the days of my hard servant? I will wait for my renewal to come. You will call and I will answer you. You will long for the creature your hands have made. In chapter 15, Eliphaz repeats his arguments from chapter 4, but now more critically of Job. Would a wise person answer with empty notions or fill their belly with a hottest wind? Would they argue with useless words, with speeches that have no value? But you even undermine piety and hinder devotion to God. Your sin prompts your mouth, you adopt the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you, not mine. Your own lips testify against you. He argues that the sinner is punished and the righteous man is blessed, so that Job's bad fortune is a result of his sin. Job responds in chapter 16 by calling his friends miserable comforters. He again accuses God of unjust treatment before calling on his intercessor. 
Even now my witness is in heaven. My advocate is on high. My intercessor is my friend as my eyes pour out tears to God. On behalf of a man he pleads with God as one pleads for a friend. Job comments in chapter 17 verse 13. If the only home I hope for is the grave, if I spread out my bed in the realm of darkness, if I say to corruption, you are my father, and to the worm, my mother, or my sister, where then is my hope? Who can see any hope for me? Bildad makes no reference to Job's comments in his second speech, which is a repeat of his first one. In chapter 18, verse 2, we read, When will you end these speeches? Be sensible and then we can talk. The lamp of a wicked man is snuffed out. The flame of his fire stops burning. And the conclusion, surely such is the dwelling of an evil man. Such is the place of one who does not know God. Bildad's argument is that bad things happen to Job because he is a sinner. In chapter 19, Job first castigates his friends for attacking him. And then decries God for abandoning him. He tears me down on every side till I am gone. He uproots my hope like a tree. His anger burns against me. He counts me among his enemies. Then he is despondent that he is alone. All my intimate friends detest me. Those I love have turned against me. Job asks for his friends to pity him. Have pity on me, my friends. Have pity, for the hand of God has struck me. But then Job has a revelation about God. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Job responds to his friends. If you say, how will we hound him? Since the root of the trouble lies in him, you should fear the sword yourself, for wrath will bring punishment by the sword, and then you will know that there is judgment. In chapter 20, Zophar retorts that he is offended by Job's assertion that he will be judged. He then repeats his previous argument that the wicked are swiftly judged. But we know that this is not always the case. And Job responds in chapter 21. Why do the wicked live on, growing old and increasing in power? They see their children established around them, their offspring before their eyes. Their homes are safe and free from fear. The rod of God is not on them. They spend their years in prosperity and go down to the grave in peace. Yet they say to God, leave us alone. We have no desire to know your ways. Have you never questioned those who travel? Have you paid no regard to their accounts? That the wicked are spared from the day of calamity? That they are delivered from the day of wrath? Who denounces their conduct to their face? Who repays them for what they have done? So, how can you console me with your nonsense? Nothing is left of your answers but falsehood. Eliphaz's third speech in chapter 22 repeats his previous speeches. Job is suffering, so he must have sinned. Is it for your piety that he rebukes you and brings charges against you? Is not your wickedness great? Are not your sins endless? Submit to God and be at peace with him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. Job replies in chapter 23 that he would argue his case before God if he could find him. He again states his innocence. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. My feet have closely followed his steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. In chapter 24, Job questions. Why does the Almighty not set times for judgment? Why must those who know him look in vain for such days? But then he finishes. But God drives away the mighty by his power. Though they become established, 
they have no assurance of life. He may let them rest in a feeling of security, but his eyes are on their ways. For a little while they are exalted, and then they are gone. They are brought low and gathered up like all others. They are cut off like heads of grain. In chapter 25, Bildad repeats his argument. Dominion and all belong to God. He establishes order in the heights of heaven. How then can a mortal be righteous before God? How can one born of woman be pure? Job interrupts Bildad and replies sarcastically at the beginning of chapter 26. What advice you have offered to one without wisdom and what great insight you have displayed. But note that in all the comments and criticisms, none of the friends prayed with or for Job. Job responds that if man cannot understand how God arranges the physical world, how can man know the answers to human suffering? In chapter 27, Job addresses all three of his friends. He starts by declaring that God is the source of his misery. As surely as God lives, who has denied me justice, the Almighty, who has made my life bitter, I will never admit you are in the right till I die. I will not deny my integrity. Job states to his friends, I will teach you about the power of God, the ways of the Almighty I will not conceal. You have all seen this yourself. Why then this meaningless talk? Chapter 28 talks about wisdom, the search for it, the inability to find it, and true wisdom is found in the Lord. And he, who is God, said to the human race, The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. In chapter 29, Job recalls the days when all was well. Oh, for the days when I was in my prime, when God's intimate friendship blessed my house, when the Almighty was still with me and my children were around me, when my path was drenched, with cream and the rock poured out for me streams of olive oil. I put on righteousness as my clothing, justice was my robe and my turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I took up the case of the stranger. Chapter 30 opens with Job lamenting that those who previously looked up to him now look down on him and that this has happened because God has turned on him. Job has cried out to God but received no answer. Job is not privy to the discussion between Satan and God in chapters 1 and 2, but is Satan bringing this affliction on him to prove that Job's faithfulness is not just based on what he gets from God, the position that the friends are supporting. In chapter 31, Job curses himself if he has lusted after a girl or deceived anyone or ignored the needs of the widows and orphans. In discussing his servants, or more likely slaves, he says, If I have denied justice to any of my servants, whether male or female, when they had a grievous against me, what will I do when God confronts me? What will I answer when called to account? Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one formed us both within our mothers? While Job did many things right, he did not appreciate that while we may be less sinful than the next person, still all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Job finishes, Oh, that I had someone to hear me. I sign now my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser put his indictment in writing, surely I would wear it on my shoulder. I would put it on like a crown. I would give him an account of my every step. I will present it to him as to a ruler. In chapter 32, we meet Elihu, a young man who became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God, and with Job's friends for failing to refute Job. Despite his young age, Elihu announces that I thought age should speak, advanced years should teach wisdom, but it's the spirit and the person, the breath of the Almighty, that gives them understanding. It's not only the old who are wise, not only the aged who understand what is right. Elihu says that 
I too will have my say. I too will tell what I know. For I am full of words and the spirit within me compels me. Elihu reflects back Job's own words. But you have said in my hearing, I heard the very words. I am pure, I have done no wrong, I am clean and free from sin. Yet God has found fault with me. He considers me his enemy. He fastens my feet in shackles. He keeps close watch on all my paths. But I tell you, in this you are not right. For God is greater than any mortal. Why do you complain to him that he responds to no one's words? For God does speak, now one way, now another, though no one perceives it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on people as they slumber in their beds, he may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings, to turn them from wrongdoing and keep them from pride, to preserve them from the pit, their lives from perishing by the sword. Yet if there's an angel at their side, a messenger, one out of a thousand, sent to them to, to tell them how to be upright, and he's gracious to that person and says to God, Spare them from going down to the pit, I've found a ransom for them. Let their flesh be renewed like a child's. Let them be restored as in the days of their youth. Then that person can pray to God and find favour with him. They will see God's face and shout for joy. He will restore them to the full well-being. And they will go to others and say, I have sinned, I have perverted what is right. But I did not get what I deserved. God has delivered me from going down to the pit, and I shall live to enjoy the light of life. God does all these things to a person, twice, even three times, to turn them back from the pit, that the light of life may shine on them. In chapter 34, Elihu then goes on to outline that God knows what men are doing. So listen to me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God to do evil, from the Almighty to do wrong. He repays everyone for what they've done. He brings on them what their conduct deserves. It's unthinkable that God would do wrong, that the Almighty would pervert justice. His eyes are on the way of mortals. He sees their every step. There's no deep shadow, no utter darkness where evildoers can hide. God has no need to examine people further that they should come before him for judgment. Elihu concludes that being more righteous than the next man does not make you righteous. Job speaks without knowledge. His words lack insight. In chapter 35, Elihu points out to Job that he's not righteous next to God. Whether Job is righteous or not affects men, not God. God does not need us. But when men cry out to God, he does not answer when people cry out because of the arrogance of the wicked. Indeed, God does not listen to their empty plea. The Almighty pays no attention to it. So Elihu concludes, so Job opens his mouth with empty talk. Without knowledge, he multiplies words. In chapter 36, Elihu goes on to say how much man needs God. God is mighty, but despises no one. He is mighty and firm in his purpose. He does not keep the wicked alive, but gives the afflicted their rights. He does not take his eyes off the righteous. He enthrones them with kings and exalts them forever. But if people are bound in chains, held fast by cords of affliction, he tells them what they've done, that they've sinned arrogantly. He makes them listen to correction and commands them to repent of their evil. If they obey and serve him, they will spend the rest of their days in prosperity and their years in contentment. But if they do not listen, they will perish by the sword and die without knowledge. For those who suffer, he delivers in their suffering. He speaks to them in their affliction. He is wooing you from the jaws of distress to a spacious place free from restriction, to the comfort of your table laden with choice food. Elihu goes on to tell us in the end of the chapter 36 and 37 what we can learn from God by studying his creation. Elihu tells Job to stop and consider God's wonders. The Almighty is beyond our reach and exalted in power, and his justice and great righteousness he does not oppress. Therefore people revere him, for does he not have regard for all the wise in heart? Chapter 38 opens with God answering Job and declaring, Who is this that obscure my plans with words without knowledge? Addressing both Job and his three friends, he then says, Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. The questions start with, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me, if you understand. Verse 7 talks about the joy of creation, the morning stars singing together. Refuting the image of God as a grumpy old man, when we say that the joy of the Lord is our strength, then the Lord must be joyful. The questions God asks address the order of the universe. Who shut up the seas behind doors and fix limits for it? Who arranged the dawn each morning? God continues. 
Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me, if you know all this, surely you know, for you are already born. You have lived so many years. God then turns to the heavens and asks Job what he knows about the stars. God then moves on to ask Job about the natural world, questions about where birds and mammals get their food and how they produce their offspring, and even where they get their characteristics from, posing the rhetorical question. If God can be trusted to do all this, why can we not trust him when it comes to our experiencing suffering? God uses the ostrich as a lesson to avoid comparison with the others. It cannot fly, has little intelligence and takes little care of its young, but when it comes to running, it can outrun a horse. God has given each of us different skills and talents. We are to make the most of what we have, not to worry about why we are not the same as the next person. God then demands Job answer him in chapter 40. Job has been persuaded by God's questions. Then Job answered the Lord. I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. In chapter 40, God asks a key question of Job. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? The question underlies two assumptions we make when we complain that God allows bad things to happen to good people. Firstly, we assume that some people are good, contradictory to the Bible's teaching. And secondly, we assume that we can tell the difference between good and bad things. God then asked Job if he can overpower behemoth, that is the forces of chaos. And then if he can control Lathbarathon, that is the evil forces that attempted to keep the world in chaos when God created it. That is Satan and the fallen angels. Job repents of his accusations against God in chapter 42. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job discovered not only that God was more powerful than he imagined, but he was much more merciful than he imagined. God is also more interested in friendship and is wiser than Job had imagined. God tells Job to pray for his three friends and he will accept Job's prayer and not treat them according to their folly of not speaking what is right about God. Elihu is not mentioned, implying that he was not wrong in what he said about God. In verse 9, Job discovers that God answers our prayers when we pray with faith and a sincere heart towards him. God blesses Job by restoring him, giving him twice as many livestock as he had before, and the three daughters and seven sons, the same number he lost. Job lives another 140 years and dies old and full of years. The Book of Job Conclusion The Book of Job teaches us that God may allow suffering to enter our lives for a number of reasons. Firstly, to test us, then to discipline us, to humble us, to change our perspective, to prepare us for blessings in the future. The lesson Job ultimately learned through his sufferings is that God alone is in sovereign control over all things. The Book of Job poses many reasons for the existence of suffering. But the simplistic answers of Job's three friends are unworthy of God. Note that the uh, Job's three friends answer with half-truths. But these are just as um, erroneous as lies. Just because um, a prayer may not be answered because someone does not have enough faith does not mean that every unanswered prayer is due to a lack of faith. There are many complex reasons why things happen. And we just can't apply a simplistic formula. In the same way, we have to be concerned about the prosperity gospel that has an attitude that 
if we do this, then we will receive that, which goes back to the very uh, substance of Satan's uh, complaint to God about Job, that Job only worshipped God because of what he received back from him. But God is far more concerned that we trust him than we understand him, since his ways and his wisdom far exceed our own. The book of Job also gives us glimpses of God's redemption plan, our defence lawyer and redeemer. God is not a spectator in the world's suffering. God has suffered for us, and he knows that it's better to endure short-term suffering in order for us to be saved than have to endure eternal suffering of dying without accepting Jesus as Saviour. And so today, if you don't know Jesus as Saviour and you wish to avoid that suffering, now is the time of um, salvation, as the Apostle Paul said. And to be saved, we just have to simply do two things. We have to believe in our hearts that um, God raised Jesus from the dead after he was crucified. And we have to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and Saviour of our lives. So if you'd like to do that, then pray this simple prayer with us. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight as sinners. We are not righteous of our own self, Father God, but uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Father God, I can only be made righteous by accepting the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary, who paid the price for our sins. And so tonight, Father God, I turn away from all my sins. I renounce them, Father God. I declare that from this time forth I shall follow you that I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus Christ from the dead after he died on Calvary to pay the price for my sins. And I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Saviour from this day forth. And that I will turn and repent, turn away from all of my sins and I will pursue the righteousness of God. I would join a local church and read the Bible, Father God, so I, and spend time in prayer so that I would get to know and understand you more and learn more about your ways and of your great mercy and faithfulness. Now I just give you all the glory, the honour and the praise, for I am now a member of the kingdom of God. In the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. In the book of Job, looking at the life of Job back in those days, Job was blameless, he feared God. He was blessed abundantly, and although Job was blessed abundantly, a man of integrity, what is mindful that stands out in the in that the teaching of Job? Satan recognized the abundant blessings in Job's life, and because God has blessed him, there'll be no form of curse in his life. But it's amazing how God had, in his sovereignty, in his holiness, when Satan approached him and told God that he's roaming back and forth when God asked the question, where have you come from? I'm back and forth throughout the earth. Searching. He's searching for an available vessel. God answers him, Have you considered my servant Job? Now the relationship that Job had with God, it had to be special. For God to brag on Job like that. And Satan also recognized the blessings of God in one's life. It's because of a hedge of protection God has in an individual or the household or family. And only when God gives the permission to Satan, he was able to do what he intended to do. But God is a giver of life. He gives life and he takes it. There's one thing Satan could not have done to Job was to take his life. What is that saying? God himself, he's still in control. 
and situations that happen in our lives is not by chance. It's by purpose and alignment according to his will for our lives. And although things are, you go well for us at, in some seasons, God is still the God of the mountaintop and he's still God in the valley in our lives. Sometimes we don't understand what was, what's happening. But it brings us back to the point and understanding the importance that God always has the final word and everything. He is the one, in spite of how dark the situation looks, he brings light and life into it. He brings healing and restoration where things have been stolen or taken away. God is the one who's able to put back into place what has been broken in the life of Job. We've heard how in spite of Job was going through his circumstances and situations in life, even losing part of his family, even having words from his wife and why don't you curse God and die, Job recognized the sovereignty of the Holy One. Job recognized that it was only because of God's loving kindness, his grace and his mercy, the very breath that he breathed, God allowed him in him to glorify him. Job did not realize the conversation that Satan had with God. But one thing he did realize at the end of all the process that he had to go through. That the almighty God. Who had purpose for him. And come to that point in his life. That any and everything that goes on and happens. God alone. Speak for things and it comes to pass. And there's no power greater than God's power. And saying all that to say in conclusion, not only leaders, but even in our daily lives, things may be gloomy, not going the way you're hoping to, be devastating, confusion, frustration. But we ask ourselves, does God know? Yes, he does know. Why are all these happening? What it is, is about to seek his face, get back into his word. Believe his word about everything else. Can God brag on you the way he bragged on Job? Can God say, test my servant? Because God knows the faithfulness the sincerity of our hearts towards him. But can God speak boldly to the accuser and to tell them, yes, they are blameless. They are integrity. They are my faithful servants. And only was allowed by the power of God takes place. But always remember, for every situation, God always has a plan, a purpose, potentials, fulfillment in our lives. So we brought back to that point in our life and know that the sovereignty and the holiness of God, the existence of our heavenly father, the desire of him for us to be drawn closer to him 
and have a full understanding of who he is, not what he can give us, of who he is. That's God's desire. We have seen the demonstration of that where God has blessed Job double of what he had lost. God knows our every need, even before we think it or ask for it. And yet at the same time, God will always make the divine connection in fulfilling in our lives, bringing to pass everything that's needed. So we become not so Focus on our natural blessings, but to be more focused on him, the sovereign God, who's able to do any and everything. And his love for us is unending. And yes, at times, even in our physical body, we grow weak. And in the book of Job, the joy of the Lord is our strength. But not just saying it, believing it in your heart. I believe in the book of Job, the teachings, as a reminder to all of us that it's not the physical blessing that matters most. What matters to God is living your life that pleases him so that others may come to a full understanding of who he is. But lastly, in the book of Job, in spite of Job's situation and he's going through and his three friends, isn't it amazing how God told Job to pray for them? The ones that were finding many, each and every excuse to try to justify the what Job was going through. And then God telling Job to pray for them. That's an, that's an, an amazement of our Heavenly Father. And my understanding of it is, although they accuse us, they criticize, despising the rejection it still comes back to the forgiveness the forgiveness brings about healing deliverance and restoration and God himself can use us in that situation so despise not small beginnings but keep our eyes focused on our heavenly father on the eternal blessings which is stored up for us the creator of heaven and earth i pray that you are blessed in this teaching today and always remember the god who sees all and he hears all is always debatable to bring about in our lives changes, transformation, but most importantly, to use us in a ways fulfilling His will, not our will, and living our lives His ways, demonstrating not being Christian, but being Christ-like and walking uprightly before him. Continue to trust God and believe in who he said he is. He is the great I am that I am. And he still cares and he still loves you. All of us the same. And all he's saying, continue to look unto me not the situation. Be blessed. Amen.